we can get started. <laughs> I just started the recording, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> Thankfully, I remembered. <laughs> All right. Um, so basically, I was going to start with site, site selection. Um, generally, this starts uh, with a pre-selection visit. Um, depending on your group and how things go, um, the study sponsor or the clinical research organization, otherwise known as a CRO, oftentimes um, will reach out to the PI. Sometimes if they already have your name, they'll reach out to you if you're a coordinator or a manager who's worked with them before. Basically, at this visit, the sponsor is trying to determine if our site is a good match for what they're looking for um, relates to the study. So what they're going to want to know from you as a coordinator or a manager is approximately the total number of patients with that indication that the study is looking for that are seen at our site. Um, they want to know what our capabilities are at the institution. So you need to know kind of, you know, what, what we can do related to imaging, lab space, pharmacy, all of those types of things. Um, and they're going to want to, you're going to need to be able to answer general questions about how long it takes to, you know, get a trial open um, at our institution. Are there any additional reviews that need to happen? Um, in the Cancer Center, we have lots of additional reviews that need to happen. Um, you know, when I worked in other areas, I have not been in cancer my entire uh, career. Um, we didn't have any additional reviews. So, um, you know, you're going to want to know that and know that every institution is a little bit different, so that's why they're asking you. Um, we always like to ask the sponsor how many total sites are going to be involved. Um, if any of those sites have opened the trial yet, and then what their expected timeline is of the study. Um, uh, this is again, is, they may request um, the investigators, CV, license, city training. They may need to have IATA certificates. They may need to know what our site considers normal, all of those types of things at this pre-site selection visit, um, or sometimes they'll call them, they will loop them in with qualification visits as well. Um, this is really small, but again, this is a sample text that we are now providing to sponsors. Again, it's in the box if you want to, um, if you want to view this whole thing. But basically what we have included here are links, and we send this out to the sponsor as soon as they ask us for a pre-site visit or a pre-selection visit. It includes all of the um, IRB's template language, guidance documents. It includes guidelines for negotiating those things, our IRB policies and procedures, including you know, links to their memos with the FWA numbers. All of those things that you find yourself repeating over and over and over again to sponsors, these links are, are the public links. Um, so we send these out. We find that this tends to turn our site selection visits from a two-hour call to somewhere between 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and I tell the CRO or the sponsor if they ask me questions that are answered in these documents, please go back to the email and look at the links. It's available for you there. Um, one of the things that we need to remember is that for industry-sponsored studies, we are needed by these pharmaceutical companies. They can't get their products approved without us. So it's up to them to do as much work as we're going to do, too. So. Um, Anyway, this includes all the SOPs for everything. We include pharmacy SOPs. We include our SOPs. Um, there is a virtual site tour on here. Um, and we have done that because that then allows us to do these visits um, remotely. Mm -hmm. um, so if you haven't done that, um, I would suggest to do that. Um, everyone's in a space crunch. We just don't have space to, you know, do these visits all the time. Um, so that's basically what this is. And then it asks for some additional questions from them 
at the bottom. Again, this is in the box. You got, I sent this as a Word document so you can cut and paste it, create your own. I have it as a quick part in my email. Um, add in your own links, those types of things. Take out the ones that don't make sense for you. But um, I apologize. I don't have a related question with mm -hmm. that. Um, somebody was just asking if you would maybe be editing the sponsor letter to include Florence and the new Encore Financials, or should they just edit themselves? We usually don't talk about Florence and Encore Financials at this point. Mm -hmm. This point is we don't know if we're going to be doing this study at all. So this is very high level. This is not, these are all, remember, these are the publicly available information. Um, about IDS, about the IRB, those types of things. Once we are site selected, and I'll get to that, we do have another template that we send out to them um, that will include Encore Financials and Florence and how to get into Florence. Um, but this is at the very, very beginning where they're trying to figure out if you fit with them and if, you know. Um, anyway, so then we're going to get so did your meeting, everybody has gone through all of the documents. Um, generally, you'll get a site selection letter. Sometimes they want to do a visit. Um, we're starting to see more people wanting to do visits at this time. Um, I'm personally trying to push back um, that you really don't need a visit. Um, since, you know, we're not a standalone little clinic. I think. You know, there are places that do have, you know, independent practices that do do some research. That makes more sense to me. Um, usually I just say we don't have the time and most people are okay with that. Um, once you get your site selection letter, you should get a letter. Sometimes it's just an email. You want to save that. Make sure that you keep that for your institutional file. Um, and at this point is when we would then inter start entering these things into Encore mm -hmm. and Florence. Mm -hmm. um, because you should get the regulatory packet as well. And your regulatory packet should contain all of the pertinent information that you need. Um, they will generally send you the protocol, the IB, if it's a drug study, um, the consent template, a lab manual, pharmacy manual, you know, any of the manuals you might need. Um, they, will, they should be sending you at the same time a contract and budget template. Um, they always send you a 1572 before they send you anything else. I don't know why, but it just is what it is. <laughs> um, they want the financial disclosure forms. Um, some of the things at the bottom, the FDA okay to proceed letter, the DSMB charter, a monitoring plan if it's not in the protocol, and banking information. Those are the things that are often not sent um, in the regulatory packets from uh, industry sponsors as these are really more um, documents that MCW is requiring that I will tell you are not often required at many other institutions. So, um, but the other, so this is the things that we always need to request from the sponsor. In addition to that regulatory packet, it includes the FDA, IND, IDE, may proceed letter, any storage memos, or, um, and the DSMC letter. And this is the email that we send to them now um, once we've been site selected. Um, and basically, and it has the at, the, at the top, it has a link of how to get into Florence. Um, so that you have all of these things. Um, it has, these are the documents that we need and what it needs to say. We do have samples. I did not include those samples, um, but they are included in the box documents of examples of storage memos and examples of um, the different things that our IRB will require to be in those letters. Mm -hmm. Again, often, industry sponsors don't have these readily available because they are generally not required um, and they are not required by most of the commercial IRBs. Any more industry sponsors are utilizing mostly commercial IRBs and so that's what they have available. Um, so once you have your whole packet um, and you have a full regulatory packet, um, 
you really probably want to consider doing what I call a departmental feasibility. Um, and this is, can we do this study here successfully? Um, before you start looking at drafting any documents for our site, before you start doing anything, you know, big, big picture you want to look at, will the proposed budget cover the cost of running the trial at our location? The things that we will always look at is, does it cover the startup costs that we're going to have? Um, that's often the place where they don't cover things. Generally, the per patient costs are okay, um, but that's another thing that you want to double check um, depending on the sponsor. As you kind of get to know different companies, you'll kind of know which ones do and which ones don't cover. Um, you're gonna wanna look at for imaging and studies, is that the general process that we do here and does it align with our standard of care? Um, and can we do it? And then we often, and then we wanna look at what other freighter or MCW partners will need to be involved. Um, and you may need to call and talk to them or have the PI call and talk to another um, provider or someone who will be a sub-investigator and ask them, do you have the capacity to participate in another trial with us? Currently at the Cancer Center right now, we have a ton of studies that want to utilize or interventional radiology to do procedures. They just sometimes don't have the capacity to take that on, especially if it involves a biologic because then it shuts down one of their procedure rooms for an extended period of time or they don't have people who can do that. So ask those questions now before you get too far in because there are sometimes just a hard stop and if the providers can't do it, then they can't do it and you just have to say, I'm sorry, you know, we're not going to be able to do this. But trust me, it's a lot easier to do it at this point than after you've started the whole, the whole thing. Um, the other thing that we ask is, do we have the staff in our research group to do this, or are we going to need to reach out somewhere to another group, to the CTSI, to someone to, to do that? Um, those are all, that's all part of this kind of what I consider a departmental feasibility. Um, I do think that the Oak Ridge Operational Feasibility Tool is a pretty good roadmap to kind of think about what questions you might need to ask or think about when you're reading through the protocol. Um, and then this is just links to the feasibility tool. Um, Oak Ridge does not want you right now to submit um, until IRB initial submission. Know that this is how things are now. Things. I believe are shifting a little bit with the implementation of Encore financials, but um, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> it's um, all laid out on the financials website. It, it, it's on the financials website. You know, I guess we can figure out from there. Um, so now we're kind of really into study startup, startup at our site. Um, and there are multiple partners across the institutions that you need to make sure that you're engaging with. Um, Encore, Florence, if you need to utilize the Adult Translational Research Unit, um, Oak Rick, and then Investigational Drug Pharmacy, if you're utilizing it. Um, obviously, there are others that are not included in this. Um, you know, there may be supply chain people you need to reach out to if it's a device trial. Um, I think the majority of studies tend to be drugs, so that's what I just did, but I have done device, so yeah, there's other people. Um, at this point, once, you're, once your department and the sponsor have all agreed, like, yes, you're going to do this study or we're going to significantly move forward, we are going to move forward, is probably is when you want to put this study or request for this study protocol to be set up in Encore. Um, and you guys do this through going to the Encore page. There's a new protocol setup request. There's a whole Qualtrics form. I'm going to assume most people know how to do this. Um, they have all kinds of training and, and tip sheets and, and all types of things that Sandy Johnson and her group have put together that will walk you through it. So um, 
And then know that Florence is now mandatory for all new trials at MCW Freight Art. Um, they also have a toolbox. I left the link here um, so that you can go in and know how all of those things work. They do have some of these other tips and tricks in this toolbox for you um, for how to get monitors, those other types of vendors, into Florence if they need to. Can I interject, Cindy? Sure. Sorry, um, regarding Florence, um, just thinking when you're going through that site selection process, um, mm -hmm. it's okay to give the monitor, um, have them do their Florence training and get in because there's also a central resources finder within mm -hmm. Florence. So it has the IDS tour, it has the the true tour um, videos, it has their SOPs and things. So if that takes some of the effort off of the coordinator having to email it all, it's like, here, do your training, here's the link, go find it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Yes, yes. And I will say, you know, we are incredibly fortunate in the Cancer Center and that we have a whole separate regulatory group that does a lot of these things. Um, but. I do know what it's like on the other side. Um, <laughs> I used to have to do all of it myself, so yeah. Um, utilize the toolboxes. I left a lot of those things here for you to go out and look at um, because we don't use them as much, so I'm not as familiar with that piece, but um, they are there. Um, again, at this point, now that you put it into Encore, you're getting it all set up in Florence, you're talking to your person, I think it's another time to go back and review the protocol and make sure that you understand exactly what's in there. Um, one thing that I think a lot of new coordinators misinterpret is sometimes the person that they're talking to is the contract research organization. And so they'll say, who's the sponsor? And, and they'll say, oh, it's like Cubia. And I'm like, that's not the sponsor. Who, so, and so you need to know who your sponsor is. Um, sometimes it is a drug company. Sometimes it is two drug companies. Sometimes there are multiple players involved. So it's important to know who that is. That will be definitely somewhere in the protocol, should be spelled out. Um, sometimes the funding source is there, sometimes it isn't, but that's another question to ask. Um, and is there a pass-through? You will sometimes see a pass-through entity if the pharmaceutical company is a um, is not the main pharmaceutical company is in another country. Sometimes there will be a pass-through in the U.S. Um, you need to know if they're relying on it, if they would like you to rely on another institution or if they're insisting on another IRB being the IRB of record for the study. Um, this is another time, I think this is when I really do a deep dive into the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Make sure that it makes sense. Um, and, you know, I will say that I have caught more times than not people forgetting to flip a greater than or less than symbol in the inclusion and exclusion. And, next, and so I think of it as, okay, I'm gonna put a patient on this study um, because sometimes I have found errors <laughs> in inclusion and exclusion and then you're like, there is physically no way to put a person on this study because if they meet the inclusion, they don't meet the exclusion and vice versa. Um, the other thing that I look at is the schedule of events. Come up with any questions and make sure that that schedule of events matches the budget that they are proposing. This is going to be extra important once you start working in Encore Financials. Um, and then look at, you know, kind of what's being asked of the patient and the potential risk. All of these things we need to know in order to draft the consent and make sure that the consent makes sense to somebody that we're asking to participate. Um, and again, things that I look for in the budget now is look for any potential subject reimbursement. Um, Sometimes it's with on an Excel spreadsheet tab that is with the individual visits and what they pay out per visit. Sometimes it is on the invoiceable list, um, but I'm a big proponent that if a pharmaceutical company is willing to pay a patient money to participate, then I don't see any reason in not paying them as long as it doesn't require me to um, obtain 6,000 receipts and all of that. 
Um, we do push back on the collection of receipts, and most of our industry sponsors are okay with that. I usually look at what, in general, kind of a general cost would be. Um, the other thing that we are now also doing is saying we will utilize the Forte payment system mm -hmm. and not any of their others. There's just too many out there. Otherwise, you, you're dealing in, you're already dealing with six or seven websites for an industry study anyway. One more is just, it creates chaos. Um, and that way we can track it and we know that our institution is, you know, compliant. Um, you want to look and see if anything is being provided by the sponsor free of charge to the patient. Um, excuse me. Um, and that's a, that I see more um, in device trials where they will charge the patient for the device. Um, even though it's an investigational device. They can do that. Um, I, it was very, very common when I was doing stroke um, research or cardiology research. Um, so don't assume that if it's an investigational device that it will be covered by the sponsor. Um, generally it is, but sometimes they can charge the patient for what they would be charging them for. Um, a non-investigational device. And then the other thing is you want to look for any procedures that are going to be invoiced to your sponsor. If they call those out in the budget, that's a good hint that when you go to do the Medicare coverage analysis or Oak Rick does the Medicare coverage analysis for you or whoever does your Medicare coverage analysis, um, that's a good hint that those procedures are not going to be covered. So you want to include those in your draft. And then the other things you're talking, you want to start looking at again is who are your sub eyes going to be, um, and do they also have the time and resources to support the trial? Um, are there any places that we are going to need additional agreements in place, even within and between maybe departments and divisions at MCW? Um, and then who needs to complete training? Um, and do they have all of the training and education and background? Um, these are all of those little things that tend to get missed <laughs> initially. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a sponsor that's like, well, you're ready to go. And you're like, oh, well, we can't start it here. Um, so we like to look at this really early on in the beginning as opposed to, I'd rather over-train people than under-train people. Um, so. Um, this is, a, you know, one of the things you may want to do is put in a true uh, adult true request if it's needed. Um, again, that goes through the CTSI website. They have a whole survey here that you fill out. Um, and then there is a separate, uh, this is one of your separate agreements that may, that will need to be signed um, by the PI. And this is another <coughs> pricing and budget that you need to encapsulate and make sure is covered in your budget. Um, and now, like, so now we've done all of this work. <laughs> You've gone through everything. At this point is really when you want to start drafting our site-specific documents. Um, there are multiple templates that the IRB has available depending on what type of study you're doing. They also have a couple of workshops out there if you need help with them. Um, you know, make this is a time to start reviewing all of the subject-facing documents and make sure that they don't need any site-specific edits. Um, and then once all of those things are drafted, and send, then you're sending a red line copy to your sponsor for approval. Um, I will say this is one thing that can get real, this is where you can get really slowed down. Um, this is where it's very, very important to have that discussion up front with the sponsor around what language in the consent drafts can and cannot be edited by the sponsor. Um, we have certain companies that in the past 
they looked at it and they said, we can't abide by that up front. And we said, okay, sorry, there's nothing we can do. Um, so, you know, that's why I always say send all of that to that sponsor at the pre-selection visit. Make sure that they have that because if they come back to me at this point that we've sent them drafts, and by now we've probably been working on a study for a couple of months, um, and they say, oh, well, we're not going to accept all of this language, I go back and I say, well, you were sent this, these documents at this time prior to site selection. This was part of what you agreed to when you agreed to having us be a site. But if you don't have that, and then they usually go, oh, okay. Right? <laughs> they, I mean, I, they don't want to spend, because the reality is, is once we send them, so you have to think about it from the sponsor's side. They have, they have consent forms, which they're, they have paid a legal group to review and ensure that they are not going to be opening them up to any additional liability or cost. Well, we don't utilize those templates. So when we send them our template, they don't just have red lines to review. They have to send that entire template to someone else for a legal review. Mm -hmm. They don't want to do that. That's extra money to them. I mean, this is what their thoughts are, right? They don't want to have to do it. That's also why it will often slow down this process because they don't just have to review changes to their template language, they have to review the entire document. So just remember that when you're sending it, that's why we send the templates to them that explain this language can be changed, this language can't. Once you get everything back and your sponsor has approved everything, there's probably multiple iterations back and forth with drafts. Um, then you're ready to submit to the IRB. Um, this is a list of all of the things. Um, this is from the eBridge protocol submission. I think most people are, you know, know what these are, but this is here. I'm not going to go into your eBridge submission, um, but know that anything that patients or the public could see related to this has to be approved. I think that's another thing that people miss out on. It's another thing that we are seeing um, come from industry sponsors a lot is, oh, well, we have a patient-facing website or we have a group that is going to help all of our sites with recruitment. We have to get all of those scripts, all of those letters, all of those web pages Anything, all of that needs to be approved by the IRB for our site if we are going to utilize it and if they are going to list our site on their website. So I think, you know, historically we think patient patient documents are things like, you know, um, surveys and questionnaires that patients need to fill out. Really, you have to kind of think about it as anything that a potential patient or a family member or whoever could see that would identify MCW as participating in this site as well. That's the last slide. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm assuming there's questions. <laughs> there are none on the chat, but okay. um, we welcome any questions for those in the room and anybody on the chat as well. You can Unmute yourself or just type it in the chat. Apparently, no one has any questions, or I made everybody completely confused. Not a question, but I, I think just an observation in talking with other with research coordinators across the enterprise is. Certainly, sponsors and CROs are not a one-size-fits-all, or even within the same organization that we've seen where, for instance, a recent one was a CRO was pushing back on the use of um, um, Epicare Link for the monitor access to, to, to Epic because they didn't agree with the confidentiality language, even though that very same sponsor and CRO use it for other studies for many, many years. It was just that one instance where somebody's a stickler and saying, we know they do it, but we're not doing it. So um, I, I think 
sometimes it's just and and don't be afraid to you know pull in your your resources if it's office of research if it's CTSI, mm -hmm. if it's OCRIC, if it's you know to help um, you know in that case you know we reach out to compliance mm -hmm. compliance can you give us some language for the coordinator to give back to them to say well here <laughs> you know just that that you don't have to try and um, respond to them on your own that you know pull in the people that can help Hi, I have a, a, a simple question. Um, I went to the website for Box and to sign up, it costs money. Do I need to sign up to have updated information in Box? No, it's a public link, so you should be able to access it from anywhere. Um, if you do have trouble, you, um, you can send me an email, at filer at mcw.edu, and I can send you those materials directly. That's great, thank you. Um, yeah, it should be an open public link, whether you're on your Gmail or your institution email. Gotcha. But I'd be happy to send it to you directly if you want to just shoot me an email. Sure. I have another question come in okay. in the chat. Um, the question is, do you usually include a fee for SIV or site qualifications? Um, we do not. That is just kind of lumped in. We have a flat startup fee um, that we hope covers the time, probably doesn't actually cover all of the time, but that type of that type of stuff is included in just our flat startup fee um, that we have other in other places that I've had uh, that I have um, worked at have have had a institutional startup fee, which covers things like the cost of Encore and Florins and all of those other systems. Um, but then we, I have been in places where we instituted a departmental startup fee that covers the startup time that, you know, our budget person, the whoever is doing all of this work before um, so the, don't be afraid to talk about that within your department um, because I will tell you a lot of other institutions will have division and department <laughs> startup fees, um, um, you know, again. And just an aside, actually, we do charge a fee for the site, for the SIB, the site initiation visit. We do not charge for the site selection visit. Um, but yes, yes, we charge. Yep. Sorry, yeah. So yeah, there is a site initiation visit charge that, that is just part of our standard budget, um, yeah. but site selection, no. A plug for Encore Financial, so now that we have a research charge master, some of those mm -hmm. protocol-related fees are there to incorporate into your budget. Yes. So we're consistent across the board. Right. Other questions? a question about um, just from a project management perspective do you start working on training or getting everyone their like accounts your, your staff that are going to be working do you wait until IRB approval or are you, are you kind of getting that going we I this is always this is the $1,000 question right <laughs> um, because you never know and sometimes IRB approvals can take a few weeks and sometimes they can take several months. Um, we tend to try to have the staff start their training when we submit for IRB approval. Um, generally, we have a ton of training that they have to do. I wait until then because in all honesty, I don't know who on my staff is going to pick up this study because startup can range from less than 90 days to a year. And, you know, if I assigned staff to that study even six months ago, half of them aren't here anymore. Um, you know, and I and I am I'm very upfront and, and honest with the sponsor and the CRO. Because um, they always want, well, you know, who's this person? Who, like, they want it. At, they want it as a pre-selection visit, mm -hmm. and I'm like, mm, sorry. I mean, and we have a policy in the cancer center that that none of that is assigned until after it goes through all of our internal approvals. Um, 
So basically, you know, I used to tell them when I wasn't in a cancer center um, that those would be assigned, that those people would be assigned at the appropriate time points, um, and then and that the coordinators would they would be they would be notified of who the coordinators were going to be at the time of initial IRB submission. Um, usually, they're okay with that. Most most industry sponsors. They don't need much more than a week to get all of those trainings sent out to the various staff. It's more the staff needs the time to be able to do the trainings usually. Um, but yeah, we usually wait. I just want to mention too that as soon as you get the site selection letter, don't be surprised if the next day your um, Oh yeah, they're gonna to want to know exactly. where your budget is. Right. Yeah, you're gonna get the site selection letter, and they're gonna say, "Do you have an update on the budget yeah. and contract yet?" Yeah. And I'm like, "And I, I, I think our office record is uh, 18 hours for yeah. a follow-up email yeah. that we just broke our record. We we have a record tally internally in our oh, yeah. in the CTO yeah. of like who's gotten the quickest reply. Right. Oh, like, I had Do you have one. a budget update <laughs> in 18 yeah. hours. Yeah. 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 Well, we had we had one. I had one that I got the site selection letter at 4:05 on a Friday. Nice. And I got the, do you have the budget when, you know, before 8 a.m. on Monday? Yeah. And I'm like, I, that's basically like 45 minutes, you know, <laughs> yeah. of, of work time. Yeah. You know, of work time. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and at that point, I usually respond and say, you know, on average, it takes this amount of time. These people will get back to you. Um, again, I have, I know I'm lucky right now. But I didn't used to be. Um, you know, it is a minimum of two weeks to review this internally. If you don't hear from me by this date, please feel free to reach out. Yeah. If they reach out in between, I just didn't answer them. Yeah. Right. And try not to give like a set date. I will have the ICF to you. Uh, you know. Yeah. I usually, I usually say. I usually right. say, and I usually would give myself a a window. larger window, right? Um, mm -hmm. I would get, if if my goal was to have it done by the 15th, I would say if you haven't heard from me by the 30th, right. please reach back out. Um, yeah. Just think, you know, obviously things happen. Um, just like anything, if you beat their expectations, they're going to be happy. So I always give them a little bit bigger. Um, do know that often the public websites will have. Um, the updated, and I can't remember how often MCW updates theirs, but it will have the average turnaround time for things like IRB approvals, those types of things. So you can't fudge that too much, um, <laughs> but you can usually give yourself, you know, yeah. a couple week breakdown. Right. Yep. Through. Um, wondering if you have any tips for assessing staff CRC capacity, particularly given that the funding and study demands as is low mm -hmm. over time. Oh, that I should say that, that is one thing that we have started to see, and we have changed, um, and we are relooking at some of our SOPs. Is that we've seen a big increase in the or decrease in the amount of time that sponsors are willing want to have data entered in from study visits. Um, we have a policy in the cancer center that the data will be entered within 10 business days. Um, a lot of them want it within five business days now and they or three. Or three. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, I mean, I'm not talking about SAEs and all that that have other timelines around them. Um, usually it's imaging they want in three days. Um, we will carve out in our contract negotiations that we will agree to X for imaging, we will agree to X amount of days for this. Um, or if they're not willing to do that, then it costs them more yeah. because it's going to it's going to take more time to get it done. Um, the metrics and and what you're going to do and how many how many studies a coordinator should have. That is a loaded question that I don't think anyone has been able to figure out. There are dissertation papers out there. Um, it depends on, I mean, it really depends on what that coordinator is doing. If you have coordinators that are doing all of the regulatory work, all of the budget negotiations, reviewing everything, making sure that, um, and seeing patients and entering data, 
Um, I think the last time I looked, the national average suggestion was about five studies at a time, five to eight, depending on where they were. Um, it is obviously, if you have people that are doing all of those things and the coordinator is really doing, seeing the patients um, and has a data assistant, like in the cancer center, the coordinators have their own caseload, but then they also, we have data assistants on all of our teams who do a lot of the data entry. We have a separate regulatory team. We have a separate budget team. They have me that does all of the study startup stuff and processing of amendments and those types of things. Our coordinators, it's not unusual for them to have 10 to 15 open trials at a time. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on what your staff is expected to do. In the, uh, in the CTO, we just keep hanging up studies until they start crying. Well, that's <laughs> well, I mean, I was, I was being nice, but yeah, that's making fun of me. Well, or I think a lot of it depends on the type of the demand of the study yeah. and yeah. like the staff. Like I work closely with mostly like Courtney here on uh, IIT that we joke is like a child. So I only have five active studies because on any given week I'm working like depending on what's going on in ebb and flow and depending on the staff that you're in the, you know, mm -hmm. the faculty you're involved with. And, you know, that can all put a big factor in the ability and the confidence of your staff. Well, not only that, one of your studies reaches out to like thousands of patients. So yeah, <laughs> and then, yeah. So you really, you really have to know, you have to know how, you have to know how many patients are going to, yeah. how many patients you're going to be seeing, how long they're in active treatment, mm -hmm. what that mm -hmm. is. Like, I mean, like IITs are a whole nother feast. Yes, yeah, that's and a that is terrible. Decision. Like that is, yeah, that that's, that's a, that could be a whole separate series. Um, they really are different. They really do require a lot more time and oversight. Um, so yeah, it just depends on the mix. Yeah, and, no, and knowing your staff. I don't cry that often, Charles. Sure. You don't cry at all. Which is why I keep going mad. <laughs> I guess the other tell is when they start keeping or looking for another job. Yeah, <laughs> but hopefully, you know, you have open, yeah. com you know, conversations yeah. with your staff so you know what they can handle. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it, like I said, it depends on what they're doing in right. their job. Right. And that's the other thing that I think we just need to remember across the institution is that people with a coordinator title can, there is a huge continuum of what they're expected to right. do depending upon what department and what area they're working in. I think it also speaks back to what you mentioned about feasibility. When you look yeah. at that internal feasibility, Absolutely. and even though MCW's strategic plan goal is to grow the number of clinical trials we have here, it's safe to say there are st some studies that aren't worthwhile. And, right. and so mm -hmm. instead of putting everyone's effort collectively, not only the coordinator, but IRB and Oak Park yep. and whoever, um, really do that deep dive and look, is, is it worth it? Is it would this benefit our patient mm -hmm. um, before you? Yeah, I mean, in. we have internal metrics and we have to justify if, if physicians want to open a study that are going to accrue less than 10 patients a year. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but again, that's based on the number of patients in general that you see. So if you're working, in, I mean, I used to work in rare diseases. So it wasn't uncommon for us to open a study that would only ever enroll three to five people. But again, you have to take into account not only who your group is that can work on studies, but also what the population of patients are in this area and region and where you're going to draw from. And if you don't know those numbers, you need to go ask the providers. Yeah. and figure that out. <laughs> I would also advocate for um, putting in a, like an I2B2 on this broker poll. So mm -hmm. that can actually, because mm -hmm. I've ran into instances where, well, IT, like, yeah, we can easily enroll like 40 patients a year. And then I'm like, oh, you yeah, do the I2B2. patients with that sort of Yeah, thing. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, well, actually, we could maybe do two, yeah. theoretically. Well, so. well, technically, you've only seen four <laughs> in the last Five don't years. always take so a I'm yeah, not yeah. exactly sure how you try and see if you can board. actually get an yeah. actual number on it right yeah, I just ran a query that came up with less than three patients yeah and the PI said, said go ahead do it plan on enrolling two okay so I will say there are some studies that it makes sense yeah to only enroll one or two patients right um, you know and 
And so it's not always about the numbers. It's not always about, is this going to be a big enroller? But you need to know that going in because that's going to impact all of your other decisions going down the line, right? How are we going to prioritize this study for, you know, in, in, in the startup process? If we, you know, is it a low priority? Is it a high priority? Those, you know, those are some of those things that come into that discussion. Um, sometimes we will do a study solely because the investigator wants to create a relationship with that industry because they're hoping that then with that sponsor because then they're hoping that they will they will provide funding for an investigator initiated trial yep. or some other study that they're working on. So. There's a lot. It's a much bigger, you know, thought process. But I think the biggest thing is just the big question of like, why are we doing it, and can we do it? Um, and sometimes investigators get really excited about the science behind it, but we don't actually have the facilities to be successful in implementing. Again, I think to your point, you know, one of the studies I used to work on the past, for instance. Um, pediatric muscular dystrophy. So mm -hmm. it's a rare rare disease, and so we opened it so there was an option for those patients. But it also goes back to who are the other centers and how close are they? Because mm -hmm. if you're also competing for the same catchment area, if it's open in Madison, if it's open in Chicago, you know. Or even Mayo. Exactly. <laughs> you know, so depending on where that, that patient population is being recruited from, mm -hmm. if it's outside of just Milwaukee area or is it state or Midwest, yep. um, yeah, absolutely. Those are all things to think about. Yeah, I mean, and we when I worked in, in rare diseases, we would open studies sometimes even if we know, and I did rare diseases when I was at Indiana and Indianapolis, so even if Cincinnati and um, Louisville and Nashville and Chicago all had them, and St. Louis all had them open, because those were generally two to three hours from where most of the patients were, mm -hmm. um, but if it was a study that was very, very intensive on visits and the patients having to come in, then yes, we would open it because we knew that although, yeah, they could, if we didn't open it, they would drive three or four hours to get their kids into those, into those studies. Yeah. Um, but if we opened it, we also knew that we would get all of those yeah. people that did drive. So again, you have to know your population. I have a question. I'm sorry, I don't want to cut into anybody uh, if they were going to say something. No, you're right on time. Okay. Um, I am wondering, um, I have uh, experience with a particular uh, pharmaceutical company who started the whole startup process. You know, they give you the go ahead but then they don't give you the IRB required documents um, like the DMC letter or, um, you know, biobanking letter or anything of that sort. And then I got stuck with it for a year. And I, um, I was wondering if you guys have any tips um, in how to deal with that kind of people or do you um, just let them know ahead of time, hey, if you're going to, if there's going to be that much of a delay, we have to up the startup fee because we'll have to put in so much more effort in the startup process itself, trying to hunt you guys down, essentially. This is a great question. <laughs> um, I don't, I will say the, the cancer center has not found a great answer to that yet. And we have, like I said, I have a study that has been in startup I think today we're at 345 days, um, oh my. which no one is happy about. <laughs> Trust me. Oh, no, um, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that I think that I mean I will say at least I know the cancer center is considering looking at having a hard deadline and then just abandoning studies after a certain amount of time. Um, yeah. Sometimes you can get lucky. And we have had times where our contract has been signed, um, and the sponsor has not has not provided the required documents. 
Um, and depending on what the language in the contract is, sometimes you can go back and say, we have to have these documents by this date, or we yeah. will be abandoning this trial, mm -hmm. and we will still be charging you for the startup fees. Mm -hmm. And that has been successful. But if you don't have a signed contract, you're kind of out of luck. In that instance, yeah. and I don't, I mean, I don't know if it, with Encore Financials if that's going to, if we're going to have cutoff times or so, anything institutionally. So I do know um, Sue Marman is working on a document just to kind of summarize that to share with sponsors that this is the process at FNMCW when it comes to why we need that red line consent language yeah. early Be and um, and you know that the budget comes early. Um, just to reinforce that that change in process, but I think along with that, just like when the sponsors say, "Where's where's your budget? Where's your red line? Where's this? Where's that?" You can do the same. It's okay to push back to say, "You know, uh, this is my only study, and you know, currently here per my last email on June whatever," um, because then you have that paper trail, and so I think. You know, follow up everything with an email, even if it's a conversation, say, because then you yeah. have that documentation. But it's okay to push on them too. So. Absolutely. The other thing that I have found success with um, when you haven't had those is if you are only dealing with the contract research yeah. organization, go to your protocol and find the medical monitor and email the medical monitor. Right, and say and say we are trying to get this open. Doctor so and so is very excited about this study. We have been waiting on these documents. This person who I have been talking to, and I name them. I mean, I'm an old nurse. I don't care anymore. <laughs> um, I, I mean, sometimes you just have to yeah. do that, right? Um, we have asked. Here is that I'm attaching the email of this discussion. Mm -hmm. Is there someone that you can connect me with? that could get me these documents. Mm -hmm. Because the other thing is sometimes, I know CROs will go to the sponsor and they will say, we need these documents. And the sponsor's like, no, they don't. Mm -hmm. You know, so right. I've had that work, you know, but yeah. you have to be willing to kind of be considered a not nice person. Right. You know, and sometimes the, uh, the CRO that you're talking, uh, the associate that you're talking yes. to, may be new in the job, and she mm -hmm. doesn't even know what you're talking about. Yep. I mean, I had you know, see uh, an associate tell me, uh, no, we don't have a DSMB. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't. It says it right here. Yeah. 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 Well, like, or you'll ask for vacant information, and they're like, why would we don't need to give you the financial? But we're like, no. <laughs> like, if I, like, like yeah. really, like you think that people know, and you sometimes yeah, have to even give think. them. Yeah, like a redacted. I've done it where it's like, here's a redacted mm -hmm. example of what I need. Right. Yeah, like, and that's what that's what I shared. Sometimes you can push for that too, but yeah. but yeah, sometimes they still won't give it to you. Mm -hmm. But in when it when I have shared examples, when I have given them explicit language, when I have done all of those things, and they're still telling me no, and it's way out there. I yes, I have been known to reach out to someone at the pharmaceutical yeah. company. I may or may not have gone on their public website LinkedIn page and emailed random people. Um, yeah. Sometimes you do what you have to do, and it's amazing when you do that. I had a physician that tweeted at someone when everyone was still using Twitter. Um, <laughs> I'm not kidding. These They, they listen to it. Um, yeah. It all depends on how much you're willing to kind of poke the yeah. bear. I just take you Thank you. Their manager. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, they, uh, sorry, thank you. Uh, that was really helpful. But I have one more quick question. I um, went to, so I'm at the startup process right now. And um, I am, um, I went to an investigator meeting and they told me a whole bunch of things which are not listed in the protocol. Um, stuff like timelines. You expect us to do these things, which makes sense, but you, um, they want us to, do the first screening visit five days after the site activation, which there is no possible way we can do that. That's just. Yeah, they want you to do that. It never happens. Yeah. Wishful thinking. They, they, yeah. they put those things out there. I have never seen a sponsor enforce any of that. Oh, I mean, good to know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Right. Thank you. I mean, yeah. I, 
I'll, I'll, I don't know. Has anyone else seen no, no. like, no. you know, I mean, I will say they will say, oh, our first monitoring visit needs to be within 10 days after the first, you know, patient yeah, visit. Will. That they will do, yeah. but the you need to have X number of patients screened within the SIV date. It's a lofty goal. It's a lofty goal. It's just like their timelines. I guarantee you none of their first patient visits and last patient visits are ever correct. No. Right. And, and you always defer to the protocol and mm -hmm. your yep. contract. Those yep. are the two things mm -hmm. that, that yep. drive what we do. Yep. Perfect. Exactly. Thank you. If it's not in the protocol or contract, you don't have to, you know, have to worry about those. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining. Yay. This is fun. This is fun. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's nice to be seeking people.